first, I want to thank you all for, for sticking around. It's the afternoon, and it's miserably hot. And so bear, bear with us for another 45 minutes or so. Uh, so, and uh, my name is Emma Humphreys. Uh, this is my first open source bridge. Been very excited with the talks that I've heard so far today. Been very excited to be part of this, this trifecta about names, gender, and identity. That's great. I mean, um, I see Nick who, who spoke for, uh, first on storing names and all the fun that you can have when you're trying to store names. Then we just got back from a talk on um, on storing gender and how we represent gender in systems. Today we're going to talk about renaming. And um, of course, if you do want to tweet about this, I'd like for you to use the hashtag name fail if you're so inclined so I can go back and recover, uh, recover the tweets. I, uh, I promise I won't yell at you if you said anything rude. Um, so let me continue on about you know who I am and what I'm doing here with this. So. I'm an engineer. I, I work at a startup in, uh, in Mountain View, Cal uh, California. Previously, I've worked in security uh, company, computer security companies. I've worked for Apple. I've worked for Linden Lab on Second Life. Life. Um, I'm not originally an engineer by training. I was an economist, and so I successfully transitioned that, and I figured I'd successfully transition again. Um, so I, yes, I, I recently went through the process of changing my legal name, and um, something that came up in the conference on Nick's talk about that legal name is sort of a is sort of an ambiguous term in the United States. We don't have legal names; we have names attached to various records, like driver's licenses and social security numbers. So you can say, as I, I changed, I made a court-ordered change that enabled me to start a cascade of other changes. And. This necklace that I'm wearing today, uh, that's, the, that's, that's the tag on it. Uh, having friends who celebrate these changes in our lives with us is absolutely awesome. This is, was given to me by my friend Jesse, who I work with a lot on WISCON and WISCON related things. So, so, so having friends who help, uh, who help celebrate this with you, friends who make geeky jokes about it are even better. And finally, uh, the last qualification, you know, class, class qualification I would have to talk about this is that about 10 years ago or 11 years ago, I did this thing called the Unitarian Jihad Name Generator. How many of y'all remember that? How many of y'all pasted it into your live journals? Yes. Yes. Yeah, this is the one. It, it's been through some iterations. Um, iterations. And I figure if that doesn't establish my bona fides to talk about, name, uh, about names, well, you know. So now I'm just going to walk through just some disclaimers. There was this television program when I used to live in Madison. There was a program called What Do You Know? And at the beginning of every episode, they get a volunteer from the audience to read the four disclaimers. OK, someone else recognizes that show. So. First, I'm not an information architect. I'm not a UI designer. I'm not a user experience engineer. That should be UX, not UE um, per, uh, person. So a lot of this is coming from my experiences, again, from the being on the business end of these systems, systems as opposed to building these systems. And again, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not, you know. Don't implement this saying we won't get sued if you do what Emma says. You just do it because I said so. And this is the first version of this talk, and unfortunately, it is US centric for now because I need to do more research um, on how this, how this matter happens when I start internationalizing it. So, uh, you know, I'm Sister Railgun of Desireful Mindfulness. You may have also known me as Erewhon. Has, uh, has MCH from Dream With. And yeah, that name. So, we have lots of names. Names. So, this is, this is why names matter. Uh, it's a personal thing to be called by the right name, whether it's by your friends, by a family, by a stranger who's, uh, you know, the nurse who comes out and greets you, um, to, uh, or the physician assistant who comes out and greets you when you're waiting at the, uh, uh, at the medical clinic, clinic, 
when you go to the bank, when you call the bank, when you go to a website, right, you want to be called by the name you want to be called by. So I'm going to cover three things today. I'm going to talk about, again, why this matters, and this affects a broad number of people, not just people in my situation. I'm going to talk about the catalog of fail, sort of three areas where this falls, you know, where things like this fall apart on to give you some examples of it. I'm also going to give you, and it's not on this slide, I'm going to walk you through a couple of ways that we've tried to address this problem. One in my experience when I worked at Linden Lab as a project manager, and another one in, uh, with my experiences right now with Kaiser Permanente. And then I'm going to give you a prescriptive piece of what you should do next. That is, you know, after firing the bad apples. Uh, I really loved the keynote this morning. So again, as I said, name changes aren't just for girls like us. The first place you probably run into name change a lot in the United States is marriage. I'm going to frame this by saying, you know, that this is a cultural norm. I'm not endorsing a cultural norm here. It's just this is something that happens in that 80% of US residents who identify as women, when they marry, they change their name. So that's a lot of name changes that you get. Now, most states, nearly every state, your name change is free. You do not have to pay. You do not need to get a court order. But that still triggers a whole cascade of name changes. You still have to change your social security number. You still have to change your driver's license, your passport, your bank cards, your Facebook account, your all your other you know, accounts where you have names. Then you got the problem or not problem, and that, that, that's problematic of me to call it a problem, is that the fact is around 40 to 50 percent of marriage is still in divorce. And again, some states give you a free name change as part of your divorce. Other states require you to pay, uh, get a court order name change. But on the back end of that, now you still have to go through and change your social, your driver's license, your passport, all your accounts, all over again, that whole process. So name changes affect more than just, you know, more, uh, more, than, more than just people who are changing their name, name for the purposes of also changing their gender or changing their presentation. Another area, immigration and naturalization. We still have a large number of people, once they um, become uh, naturalized U.S. citizens, will change their name. Some of them will do that to just essentially feel like they're fitting in better. Again, you know, I, I'm not endorsing this. I'm just saying this is a practice that we observe in the field. And finally, 40% of trans people do not have ID matching their gender. So this is more personal to me. I've been fortunate I've been able to do that. But it is, one, it's an expensive process. Two, depending on where you live in the United States, you may not even be able to do it. Some states are very regressive in their pol uh, policies towards changing, uh, changing your name, changing your gender, what you have to do, whether or not you have to have a uh, demonstrated medical surgical intervention to do, uh, to do it. Other places are more, uh, much more progressive about it. In California, for example, we do not have to demonstrate a medical intervention. All we need to have is a physician's letter. A physician's letter on and, uh, up in and of itself is still very um, and I will put into the notes of the slide, there's a really great po uh, post by Tim Chavalier uh, who talks about this with regards to the physician's note that is required to change the gender market on your California driver's license. So even if you have the means and resources to navigate these systems, uh, systems there's still some fundamental unfairness. We're not going to be able to address that here. It is a political issue, which is one I hope you'll take back with you. Um, these two web pages have been mentioned again and again today. I'll mention them again, uh, for those of you who missed it earlier. There is the falsehoods that programmers believe about names. 
Um, these talks, these slides will be back up on my GitHub archive. I've got preliminary version of the slides up. I'll have a more final version of the slides up and marked down, uh, down with more notes, and these will be linked in it. And then finally, also personal names around the world from the W3C. Um, this doesn't address sort of these issues, but again, it's a really useful discussion where these things start from. But let's get down to name fail. And I'm going to talk about three examples of name fail. And some of the, and these have all been happening to me in the courses of my name change. First is just simple. Computers are really good at microaggressions. They're fast. They're stupid. You do what they tell them to do, and they will do the wrong thing over and over and over again. And a great place to see this sort of microaggression in, in play is electronic mail. Okay, so under my old name, I swiped my American Express card through a square machine. You know, and this is like two or three years ago, and then Square just says, hey, do you want an email address, uh, address you enter? It will send the receipt to you. So I go, that's a really neat thing. I'll go ahead and do that. And I go ahead and blithely enter my old email address. And then Square maps that and my old name in their systems, and then this happened. I'm coming back from Wisconsin, a convention that I go to in Madison, Wisconsin, flying through um, um, Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix is home to a really wonderful place called Cartel Coffee. Uh, if you're in the Southwest Terminal and have a layover, I recommend that you go over there. They do hand pour overs, they do Chemex, they do uh, aero presses, and they are very polite to me and my partner, but then Square kind of ruined the experience afterwards <laughs> by sending that to me. Another place where we get this is, of course, in recruiter systems. If you put your resume on the internet, then it stays there forever. And this came in, this was literally this morning. So, even though I've updated my LinkedIn, even though I have put permanent redirects on my personal website to redirect anybody trying to find the resume under my old name will find the resume under my current name, name my chosen name, name, there's still hundreds of systems out there that have me as dead name. And one is the question, of course, is I have no idea why they think I'm a Ruby on Rails programmer. I'm a, I, do, I do JavaScript, I do Java. I do, I do a little bit of Python, <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, and, and also, boy, you know, they want to interview me on a Sunday, so this place is already looking kind of sketchy, but, you know, it's like they at least could have gotten my, you know, they could have gotten my name right. So, again, so that's a place where we have, you know, so this is, this is an area, of course, again, um, think of all the emails that you send out during the course of the day. Okay. Um, or received during the uh, course of the day, and you can multiply that by 100, 200 times, and it can get fairly tiring. Um, Square, fortunately, has a straightforward way for doing this. You can go to a customer service page, but you have to know where the customer service page is. I asked on one of my, uh, one of my uh, groups online saying, hey, this happened, and someone was able to come up with a URL and say, go here, fill out this form. And sure enough, about three days later, I got an email back from a customer service rep at Square saying, oh, very sorry, ma'am, we'll go ahead and fix this for you. For, uh, for you. But I still had to do that. Um, Constant Contact, uh, MailChimp, these other systems have ways of making it very easy for you to change the email that associated uh, with your di with distribution list for marketing or for newsletters like if you do tiny uh, if you subscribe to lots of tiny letters letters um, but oddly enough these systems keep names associated with it and really what they need to keep associated with it is an email address next I'm sorry Oz <laughs> The state is transphobic, and it's transphobic, you know, in its nature. Unfortunately, um, it is very trust distrustful of those of us who change our names and or change our gender markers. They're going, why are you doing that, and what is the scrutiny behind that? There is a very good um, 
post on Medium, and again, this will be in the notes. Uh, this is by a person who goes by the name Zip. They are a transgender person uh, living in the Bay Area, and this post talks directly about that whole scrutiny that we have about gender markers. It's not quite related to this, but again, that the experience that you have when you're changing your name in Santa Clara County in California, that's San Jose, Silicon Valley, um, I had to pay $435 and to do a filing. I was able to represent myself. I had to fill out a separate form that was given to the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Department that says I am not a sex criminal. And then they looked that up. I was actually talking to Rose Hayes, who's a Googler and also on the board of the Transgender Law Center, who, is, who commented to me that I should probably follow up about that because that form may not actually be legal uh, in California law. law. So uh, again, you have to go through this additional scrutiny. In California, they recently changed it. If you're changing your name because you're changing your gender, you do not have to file any form. You do not have to file with a newspaper. Um, that's very useful. And Santa Clara, I don't have to go make a court ap uh, appearance. I have a friend of mine that actually has her court date in two days in San Francisco County, and she actually has to make a court appearance. So again, all of these aggressions around it. You know, some some places and jurisdictions are getting better about removing them, but they're still there. Then finally, there's always one more system. Um, my experience was on Amazon. So one of the reasons we want to change our names, obviously, and, agree, uh, and be addressed by the correct name is not only just the whole thing about, you know, about hearing the right name, but we have things in our name. We have the title to our car. We have the title to our house if we own a house. We have the lease agreement if we're renting and we want to be addressed and our names associated with the right thing. But now in the past 20 years, we've added more stuff that is associated with us by name, primarily digital stuff. It's the recordings that we purchase through iTunes and eMusic and Amazon Music and all of these other host of sources, all the books that we purchase through Kindle and iBook Store and Smashwords and all these other stores have licenses that are tied to our names. And if you can't fix this properly, a person is going to be faced with a choice of every time they access their digital stuff, they're going to be called by the wrong name. You don't want to be called by, hi, wrong name, here's your music library. Or this book is licensed to wrong name. Or, you know, you know, you imagine like one of your favorite books, like, you know, I always like to keep a bunch of Lois Bujold books on my iPad because it's sort of like comfort reading for me to read Civil Campaign. And imagine if I had to say every time I go to one of my favorite, you know, to a favorite book like that, and it says, this is wrong name's copy of a single, uh, of, of a Civil Campaign. So let's talk about Amazon. So. I went and started going through the process of getting my name fixed on Amazon. Okay, orders. So this is a big chunk of, of, of Amazon, which is actually, okay, I've got a shopping cart, I've got a fulfillment system, and it's figuring out, okay, this is being shipped to Emma Humphreys in San Jose, so I can get that fixed, and I can get it to directly call me by that, and I can get my music collection corrected. So that was a fairly straightforward thing. And of course, as soon as I started doing that, they started putting dresses on the Amazon front page instead of, you know, like power tools. So. <laughs> We can talk, there's a whole other talk about machine gender. How many of y'all familiar with the term machine gender? It, it's interesting. On the other hand, I don't want to have my sexual identity or my, my gender identity determined by what I shop for. I'd like to tell you what it is and not you have to guess it from that I like Eileen Fisher dresses. So everything's going fine. I'm, you know, I'm looking at this tunic that looks really cute, but I wanted to ask a question about you know, the material. So I go to the question asking interface. Well, Amazon's a company that's been around nearly 20 years. It's been around about the same time that I moved to California from Wisconsin in 1996. There's a lot of archaeology. There's a lot of old systems and software in there. And this reviews and question asking system 
is something that came about through, uh, through an acquisition. And so I'm asking this question, I'm about to hit send, and then I notice it's going to say, old name asks, no, I'm not asking, old name is not asking about that tunic. I'm asking about that tunic. So then I have to go spelunking through the system and find the place where I change my name on that content management system. So, okay, good, we've changed that. Okay, good, I can ask that question. Finally, I get this email from um, a magazine called The New Inquiry. How many of y'all subscribe to New Inquiry? Heard of it? It's, really, it's a really great lefty magazine, uh, well worth your time. Um, uh, time, and they used Amazon Payments, so every month they charge my American Express card $2 for the current issue of New Inquiry, and then would send me an electronic, two electronic copies, you know, an, a, a PDF and a, and a ebook for, uh, version. And Amazon made a change with how they were doing subscriptions so that New Inquiry, New Inquiry could not do that anymore, and so I had to change that in my I had to uh, sign up to the New Inquiry's new subscription system, and then I had to go to Amazon's system and make sure they weren't charging me $2 for something that I was already getting charged for through another system. That had my old name as still associated with it, and it was not very clear how to get that old name out. I finally sort of stumbled my way through, and I should have been taking screenshots of the whole process for this, because this has only happened in the past month. Month, And I know I got something to work right, because then I got this email saying, your Amazon Payments account is suspended because your name doesn't match the name that's on ours. And you need to send us proof of your new identity. And, and, you know, it's like, well, hey, <laughs> you know, at least I got a signal back from the system. <laughs> so I write them back and saying that. It's very lovely. I, I happen to keep a copy of my court order, a digital copy of my court order and digital copy of my new driver's license on hand for just these occasions. And then they say, nope, 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 that, sorry, that's very insecure. We, we can't send this stuff o over email. We need you to send it to our fax machine. Well, okay, so you think about this for a second, your fax machine, if it is an old school fax machine that is just plugged into a phone line, it's not plugged into the ether, you know, to the internet, it has no memory, it basically gets a fax transmission, it spits out on that horrible paper that feels so greasy and stuff, and then it's done, then that's great, that is very secure. As soon as I, mean, I, can, I can just walk up to that thing while it's printing out a fax and go, okay, it's lost, memory's volatile, it's all gone. On. Problem is, of course, if it's a Xerox or HP or any sort of modern device, it's probably connected to the internet, and there's probably a published exploit that you can buy for, you know, $75 on some dark net site that'll, you know, it's like, oh, let's grab all the identity documents off this uh, fax machine. <laughs> so, but, I mean, I, what are you going to do? I had to send them my documents. And they wrote back very quickly, you know, literally the afternoon saying, hey, you know, we got your documents, everything's fine. The only problem now is who knows what else is out there. It, it's like dark matter. It's like, you know, there's CRM systems, customer, you know, cu customer relationship management and CSR systems, customer service rep systems. They're out there and it's just like, I don't know what else is out there. <laughs> you know, what, you know, you know I, could, I could call Amazon and get, oh, hi, you, you must be dead name. No, no, no I'm, I'm Emma Humphreys. And then there's that awkward pause. So let's talk about a, a way of getting around some of these problems. This is what um, generally we, uh, in our experience at Linden Lab, we refer to as display names. And I like to call it just basically what Kaiser Permanente patients and Second Life avatars have in common. There are no, there are no Kaiser patients that I know of who are actual furry. You know, unless they have some sort of thing with, you know, extreme hair sweetness, but I'm not going to go there. So let's talk about Second Life. Second Life, I worked from, for Linden Lab from 2007 to 2010. Um, during, uh, two, during 2010, I was primarily doing project management and got brought in to help lead a, uh, to do the project management for this work that was going on around names. Now, to explain what happens in Second Life uh, before 2010, what happened when you created a Second Life account is Philip who was our founder, had interesting ideas 
some good, some bad. One of the things he had interesting ideas about was names. So when you logged in, this, when you created a character in Second Life, when you created an avatar, what you used to be confronted with was a system that would basically say, enter a first name, and then pick a, and then pick a last name from a menu of available, uh, available last names. Um, these names would circulate. You, they'd allow about 10,000 avatars. Yaz, do you remember what, what the number of avatars we would create, we're allowed to create under a particular last name was? Like 10,000, 5,000, 1,000? Uh, per last name, yeah. No. Sorry. I think it was like, I think it was like 10,000. A lot. I can't, I, I, I don't have count. There are, there are obsessive sites that actually kept track of the number of last names in circulation. I'd have to go dig them up. You know, it's like I would have to ask. I mean, there's a bunch of usual suspects I could go to and ask about that, but that's kind of not prevalent to the talk. Um, but anyhow, so this is how you'd pick a name. So you, they had interesting names. They had names like Steampunk. They had Ryder. Um, Ryder. The, the best, the avatar name that I dearly wanted to have when I first signed up for Second Life, and they didn't, that was already taken, was Emma Nowhere. Because it just sounded like, you know, Emma Nowhere sounded like she could be the lead of a shoegaze band. So you went through this. Now, of course, avatar names are kind of like people names, real people names, in that people want to change them. So Second Life had the notion of marriage or partnership. You could partner with another avatar. You still can. You can, uh, can in Second Life. Um, so if you partnered with another avatar, if you were like that large percentage of people who identify as women in the United States who get married and change their last name, well, they wanted to do the same thing in Second Life. If Emma Nowhere met Jane Smith, she wanted to become Jane Smith, or excuse me, Emma Smith, or maybe, maybe Jane wanted to become Emma, uh, Jane Nowhere. Or, and we couldn't do that because, again, Second Life's been around a long time. They're actually having their 12th anniversary uh, of their of their open of their uh, of their initial release this week. Uh, a friend of mine, Harper Beresford, who's a longtime Second Af uh, Second Life avatar, is is running that. Uh, Again, because of archaeology, the same situations that we had at Amazon, uh, you saw at Amazon, on it's not that easy to change an avatar name. Also, this is the case of my real life partner. What if he wanted to play a Portuguese American steampunk? Okay, what do we know about names, uh, Spanish and Portuguese names? Well, so if you wanted to be Maria Lourdes, Lourdes Rodriguez Texera, you couldn't do that in the first name, last name system. There were hacks, and there were very clever hacks because people who play Second Life are very engaged with the product. We had a scripting language. We had an environment where people can invent things. things. But you still, you know, but you still didn't have it embedded into the system. This is what we did. So in st we got rid of that old system. So, well, we didn't get rid of the old system. We buried it under a new system, excuse me. So when you register for Second Life, you would create a username that needed to be globally unique. And then you could set a display name on top of that. Now, the skeleton buried underneath here is that there was actually another thing here, and I actually need to create another slide for this, which is that everybody who registered once we switched over to the display name system had the last name resident. But on the other hand, it, you know, it covered this big problem. People got to use the names they wanted to use. You know, people who were doing serious, you know, role-playing games in Second Life, who they would be, you know, one weekend they would be, you know, they would be a high elf. The next weekend they would be an urchin in a Victorian, you know, in a in a Victorian steampunk dystopia. They could change their names. They could use Unicode in their names. People got really creative with Unicode and created all kinds of unreadable names. Names. So this is all good. Yes, this is wonderful. Except, you know, in that part where I said that we had user-created content in Second Life, we've had, you know, at that point we had around seven or eight years of user-created content in Second Life. A lot of that 
content that was created in Second Life needed to know who it belonged to because we also had a property rights system, a digital property rights system, uh, you know, that goods could be transferable, copyable, or modifiable, or some combination of those of the three. And now you could have something where you could have Emma Nowhere's chair, and that's great, except then Emma Nowhere changes her display name to be Jane Nowhere, and the chair would not address her by the correct name because it was referring to the old software interfaces and the old APIs. So you ended up writing code like this. This is um, LSL. I don't expect you all to, follow, you know, to, to, to read this deeply. This is just an example of Linden scripting language that would be inside of an object that would basically try to answer the question, what is the person's name? And it would first say, hey, OK, let me go to the display name system and get the uh, username for this UUID. Um, the display name system could fall over or die or not return, so there was all, you had to handle the case of, well, what if it doesn't return anything or returns an error? error? So then we have to go back through and find the old Second Life name. Then we need to double check and see, okay, is their last name resonant? Because then that would be under the new display name system, and so we need to throw away the first part of that name that was re returned to us and use that. And now you would have to retrofit all the, you know, the millions and millions of LSL scripts that were running or sitting in people's inventories in Second Life to fix this. Meanwhile, in real life, okay, so I'm, I, I'm a proud member of Kaiser. I love Kaiser to death. Kaiser in Northern California is doing amazing things around transgender health, uh, health and I recommend them highly. Um, Kaiser, uh, started using software written by Epic, uh, a fine Wisconsin corporation. Uh, Epic basically apparently has bought all of Verona, a suburb of Madison, and just basically absorbing it, sort of like Google is absorbing Mountain View. Um, Epic writes their patient management software. And this is the thing that keeps track of, you know, keeping track of all of these different, uh, at, you know, your test results, your diagnoses, your physician's notes, notes, all of these things. Things. Um, so, one of the things that they added to this was the notion of a preferred name. What they call it a preferred name. I, I don't like using the term preferred name because it sounds like someone has the right to sort of say, well, we know you prefer to be called Emma, but we're going to call you by that old name. So, that's why I use the term display name here. So, clinicians. We'll see that, you know, the nurse practitioner, the, issuer, the medical assistant, your doctor, doctor, a lot of people who, who are doing the clinical end of work will see your display name. And this is really great when I was in the process of waiting for my name uh, court order to come through. I could go into Kaiser and fairly have fairly good chance that I'm not going to be misnamed or misgendered when I went to see my doctor or any of my doctors but not clerical staff. So I needed to go and have a physical with my original general practice physician. And I go over and I ch sit down and I hand him my old ID and my old Kaiser card. card. And they have a nice thing on the form actually that says, okay, who is this person so, they can, you know, so that someone can, uh, so that the medical assistant can come out. Out, or someone can come out and get you, and it says, well, okay, well, it's the woman in the glasses wearing the poppy-colored tunic, tu uh, tunic, so that's that person, except they put dead name by woman in glasses and poppy-colored tunic. So I'm sitting there reading my email and get dead named. That was painful. And there was this awful quiet. I don't respond to it. I'm just like, dead name? Is dead name here? You know, I'm surrounded by people who are probably not the most trans-friendly audience in the world, unfortunately. And then finally someone sort of goes to and looks at that piece of paper and says, and then they come over and says, are you dead name? <laughs> yes, I'm dead name. I prefer to be called Emma. Go in. Sit down, nurse is like, nurse looks at me and it's like, can I wait a minute before you take my blood pressure reading? Because right now it will be, you know, infinity over infinity. 
I was like, what happened? And I said, well, I got dead named out there. What do you mean dead named? I mean, they called me by my old name. But it, and I don't understand, this is my system. It's, you know, and, you, and when, when, you know, when Dr. Benito and when Dr. Ng look at me, it says, you know, Emma Humphrey's up there, not old name. And they go, oh, sorry, okay. Okay, I got five minutes, I wanna uh, start wrap up. Uh, so, and this has become a, a long anecdote, I apologize, guys. But basically what happened is that there's a system that the clinicians see, and then there's the system that the clerical staff see. The clerical staff see a system that's based on a 3270 terminal, uh, which is very, very old school, school um, that does not display your preferred name or your display name. It displays the name that is on your social security card that your work transmitted when they signed you up for Kaiser. Other places fails, phone reminders. Another, uh, recently, this happened to a friend of mine. She was getting a phone call from Kaiser. She let it go through to her speakerphone in her car with two friends who did not know about their gender status, and Kaiser's phone system dead named them and caused them a great deal of embarrassment. So somewhere, someone at Kaiser has to write this code you know, the equivalent LSL for, for Kaiser's systems, uh, systems, so. Sorry, and that got duplicated. So in the last five minutes, I'm gonna talk about what you should be doing now. These are uh, suggestions. Basically, what I want you to do now is open Jira and create an epic called Emma Needs to Fix How We Use Names. Because at some point on hormone replacement therapy, I'm told I get magic powers. <laughs> well, that's what they say in my Slack that I'm in. And of course, nobody told me I had to use my powers for good. So before that happens, if you have systems that have names, audit where names appear in your systems. And then after that audit, you need to go through and make name changes consistent through all the systems, not just only the customer facing ones, but the ones that CSRs see, what back office sees. The only people who should be seeing your, you know, seeing your quote unquote legal or wallet name or the name that the state has decided you are is, you know, should be audit and security. And then once you get a legal name change, do they really need to see, you know, do they even need to have that audit trail in the system? Ask users what they want to be called. We already saw that Nick Hardy, uh, already had some really great slides from that, from their presentation. Um, this has also got talked about on the gender presentation. Uh, basically implement something like what we implemented in Second Life, what you see in Dream With, what you see in, uh, in several other systems, in GitHub and other places. It just basically says what name you want to be go uh, called by. And that also flows through to the emails you send, to the phone, tr uh, to the phone messages that you call, and you know, like appointment reminders, reminders, and in social media. Because if you have a system where if I talk to you, you know, if I men if I mention you on if I mention you on Twitter and you tweet back at me, you know, you should pr probably tweet back at me at the name that I uh, that I want to be called by. And then finally, uh, several people have already said this today, I'm going to reiterate it, fire your real name policy. You know, remember from the keynote, you know, we got this thing, it's a fire, you know, fire the toxic people, fire the, po you know, fire the toxic policies at your workplace, and a real name policy is definitely one of those. those. And I, I blatantly stole this from, uh, from Nick's presentation, Haitian, but if you had not seen this, this is a very simple flowchart on whether or not you should be using legal names. names. And in most instances, is no. Don't worry, I stole it myself. So. Yeah. Okay. You know. So this is a note to Mr. Zuckerberg. You're not required legally required to to, uh, to do this for Facebook. So why do you insist on doing it? And that's all I have. Uh, you know, you can reach me through emma.h.net. My slides will be up on my GitHub, and I have a, a blog on Dream with it here. So thank you all for having me.